uh, and then um, congrats on your 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 bishopric elevation. Thank you, Bernard. I appreciate it. Now, I I like this the sound of the the title of the book you, you are writing, twenty one most important questions leaders ask themselves. Uh, tell me a bit about this book and why you are you are, you are doing this. Um, this year I'm doing six books on leadership. It's called the Leaders Library. Mm. They have six books in one box called the Leaders Library. Um, and that's the volume one. I'm, I'm going to do six books every year on leadership for the next five years. Wow. And uh, I, believe, I believe that um, leadership is a very important um, ingredient for success for our nation, for, mm. for churches, for organizations. And I, I believe that it is a divine call for me. It's a divine duty for me to contribute to the quest for the solutions for the leadership crisis in Africa. Mm. I believe that the greatest need of Africa is not, is not aid, but a new breed of leader. A new breed of leader that will redefine leadership to mean service. You know, currently, leadership is defined by several people as position, power, and possession. So right from the time you were little, your mother would tell you, go to school so that when you grow up, you can get a good job and then get money and buy a car and build a house. So people go to school with that at the back of their mind. So we produce leaders who think that leadership is a position, leadership is um, power, that position brings us, brings us possession. And once you are wealthy, you become powerful. So people get into leadership position with this mentality. But we are trying to redefine leadership. Redefine leadership to mean service. Service to God, mm -hmm. service to humanity. So some of these books I'm developing these, this year is premise on this fact. It's motivated um, by that attempt to redefine leadership. I believe that the next 20 years of this country will depend on kind of leaders we are producing now. Mm. And once all of us are able to contribute to the quest for developing servant leaders, people who can define leadership as service, it will be very mm. uh, important for this country. So if leadership is not necessarily position, power, or possession, then what is it? It's service. Leadership is service. Leadership is service, Bernard. Mm. Um, leadership is service. When, when people get into leadership position, first thing they ask themselves is, what contribution can I make mm -hmm. to the development of people around me? Um, I, I believe that people, especially into uh, governance, political leadership, where immediately you get into leadership, what you are asking yourself is, what kind of contribution can I make to the development of, of, of people? It's essential. It's very important. You don't ask questions like, what benefits accrues for me in leadership? But what can I do to help people out of poverty, to help people out of suffering? It would appear that leadership has a lot of dimensions. To be writing six books every year for the next few years. I mean, for the next five years. That's about 30 books about 30 on leadership years. alone. Yes, on leadership alone. Wow. I see. I think I, I now get the, the connection with the Graduate School of Governance and Leadership, which is another leg that's right. of, of, that's of right. what you do. Because um, um, when I start looking at the questions, well, the first question will answer my passion, why I'm into leadership. I believe that we are all created and designed for particular uh, uh, purposes in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, you were designed to do what you are doing. I was designed to do what I'm doing. If I attempt to do what you are doing, I may fail. If I attempt to do what I am doing, you may fail. And, and so my passion, my passion basically is to uh, develop leaders and develop a new breed of leaders mm. called seven, seven leaders. leaders. So what are these 21 questions successful leaders ask themselves? Okay. Ben, it's important for us to note that life itself um, is a question. And the more you are able to answer the question about life, um, you are able to create a successful path for yourself. So these 21 questions um, are questions I believe that when you see anybody who has become very successful in leadership, the person has tried to answer um, um, some of these questions. The question number one is the providence question. The providence question. Why did God create me? The providence question. Why did God create me? Bernard, there are very important things in our lives that really define who we are. That God did not allow us to choose, but he chose them for us. For instance, God did not allow you to choose who gave birth to you. 
I mean, you didn't choose your parents. God chose your parents for you. You didn't choose to become a Ghanaian. God chose that for you. You didn't choose the tribe you come from. God chose that for you. You did not choose your talent. God chose them for you. So th that which defines you, who you are, were all chosen for you by God. And this should tell you that God has a major role to play um, in your life. If the, the greatest discovery that you can ever make in life is to discover why God created you. That is the greatest discovery. Because that defines your assignment on earth. You were not born by chance. You were not created by ch chance. But God had an intention for you. And God is very intentional in the things he does. You do amaze you to even note that the, your height, your, the, your size, your physique and everything is determined by God for a particular purpose. So the first question you ask yourself is why did God create me? And when you begin to recognize the God factor in your life, you begin to focus, your focus changes. The greatest men, the people who have achieved great feats in life that we admire, were people who answered this question. And the things they did, they didn't do them because they wanted just to do them. They did them because they felt that this is a divine call. I believe that you, Bernard, if you look at what you do today, mm. addressing the city and the nation every morning, if you look at it as a divine call, something that one day you will stand before God and give accounts of, something that you believe that God is just, this is just grace, that it is just God who has chosen you to be here. Your passion, your commitment to doing it will be different. And that is what the providence question answers. Mm. But it draws you closer to God. It makes you humble. It makes you focus more on grace than on greatness. Where you feel very humbled. That where I am and what I do now is more of grace than greatness. So that's the providence question. That's the providence question. I always tell my, my, my church that the privilege I have in pastoring them to me, I feel that they are even better pastors than who I am. But yet God didn't give them that opportunity, but God gave it to me. Mm. And therefore, at the back of my mind, I know that I should not waste this opportunity because better people out there who could have done it. Every achievement in life is connected to the God factor. And God gave you the grace to be where you are. And you, you realize that I've met several people who have really become really successful. One of the things I realized about these people is the fact that, you see, the more successful they become, the more humble they also become. Because at some point you realize that this is not you. There is, there is, a, there is there's something higher than you that is aiding you. Have you ever tried to find out from people the secret of their success? And most of the time you realize that they think a little bit, they pause a little, mm. and they try to come out because there is no secret to success. It is just grace. God will just grace you. The abilities you have. But you sometimes ask people, people say, oh, I chose to do this. Mm -hmm. like sometimes you will say, oh, I chose to be in broadcasting. You did not choose to be in broadcasting if it was chosen for you. Because you are into broadcasting because you have the talent for it. And the talent was placed in you by someone. So you didn't choose to be in broadcasting. You were designed to be in broadcasting. You are not in broadcasting by default. You are in broadcasting by design. This looks like the most important question then. The, the most important that. question. And that's why the first question. Okay. So how do you answer that question? Or you are just giving us the questions first before we look at how to answer them. Because if leaders ask themselves questions, there yeah. must be a way of there must be a way answering the question. Of answering the question. Yeah. Bernard, you know, if we have time, I will be able to go all through all with you. Okay. But you see, the most important thing is this. walk into any construction site. Okay. And you if you see somebody carrying hammer and nails, you immediately know that in this construction site, this is the capital. If you see someone carrying level and trowel, you know that is the mason. 
if you see somebody um, carrying uh, concrete, you know this is a Libra. You know, your tools determines your assignment. And most of the times, to know why God created you is to know the tools God gave you for your assignment. That talent, that ability in you, defines why God created you. I do what I do because I have certain talents. My capacity to research and my ability to communicate that information is the reason why I have invested. Is the reason why I'm a public speaker. Is the reason why I'm a teacher. It is not everybody that has that capacity to be able to research and communicate. You understand? The reason why I am a leader is that capacity God gave me to be able to pioneer things and manage the things and grow things and influence people to believe what I'm pioneering. So your tools will always determine your assignment. So as you sit down and you look at yourself, you will always realize that there is a talent, there is a particular uniqueness that you have. And that is what determines your assignment on it. So if you want to know why God created you, go deep down inside you, you will discover it. One of the finest speakers I listened to, preachers I listened to, is Mike Woodard. He made very, very profound statements. And what, among the profound statements I have heard him make is one that changed my life. Mm. He said that, what excites you is a clue to what you were created to do. And what annoys you is a clue to what you were created to solve. Well, can, can you repeat that? What excites you is a clue to what you were created to do. And what annoys you is a clue to what you were created to solve. Mm. So, Bernard, I sat in a classroom, one of the reasons why I got into training and development, which has now led me to becoming a university. I sat in a classroom, learning about human resource, the management, and there was a topic on human resource. And then this lecturer comes to the classroom and begins to talk about human resource development. Mm -hmm. And I got so excited about human resource, especially when it goes to training and development. I got so excited about it. And I remembered what my guru said. What excites you is a clue to what you are created to do. And this was about eight years ago. So, Immediately, I said, okay, this excites me, and I believe that this is what I was created to do. So I started writing the name of, of a company that I will use to train people in the lecture hall. Mm. Can you believe that eight years after, the lecturer who taught that human resource development course mm -hmm. now lectures in my university. Wow. Hmm. What annoys me, Bernard, is when people show ignorance. I am unable to do, my weakness is that I'm unable to do even homework with my children. Well, sometimes I sit down there and I don't understand why one plus one is equal to two and you simply cannot understand it. <laughs> you understand? So I have teachers who, please, you deal with them. This one, I cannot stand it. You deal with them. And then, so that is what annoys me. And that is a clue to what I was created to solve. Because ignorance annoys me, mm -hmm. that's why I have a university. I see. So basically, you answer the question, you ask yourself what your talent is, what you your excitement is, what annoys you. That's and right. those things point to answers to the providence question. Providence question. Good. And when you su succeed in answering the providence question, Bernard, you don't follow the crowd. You follow a conviction. Mm. You don't do things because everybody else is doing it. You do things because you, are, you believe that this is what I was created to do and this is what I was designed to do. You don't follow the first. You follow your faith. You follow your faith. A F A. T, E, you follow it because you believe that this is what I was created to do. You do not follow the path already cut, but you follow your passion. Your passion might not necessarily lead you through the path already cut. It might take you through the bush, through the forest. But what you do is that because you believe that this is what you were created to do, you pursue it. Mm -hmm. So the most important question the every question. successful leader tries to answer is the, the question, question, why did God create me? It's 40 minutes, actually 20 minutes to 9, we're talking to Bishop Titi Ofer about 21 questions leaders ask themselves, or successful leaders, and you can join us by text 54 You can follow us on Twitter, 
at CT973 or my Twitter handle Ben Koku. We're also on Facebook. You can send questions and you answer them. What's the second question? The second the second question is the purpose question. The purpose question. Where am I going? Where am I going? What most successful people have succeeded in doing is that they have succeeded in developing a roadmap for their lives. A roadmap that tells them this is where I am going. This is how to get there. This is how long it will take me to get there. And these are alternative routes to where I am going. You know, Bernard, the simplest definition of leadership I've ever had is that a leader is someone who knows where he's going, who knows how to get there, who knows when to get there, and who knows how to influence people to go with him or with her. If you don't know where you are going, or if your life is not driven by purpose, mm. other forces will drive your life in circles. So what you do, you see is that all the time you are at one place, you are not moving forward, you are not going anywhere. So the purpose question is the one of the most important questions successful people ask themselves. And this is how you are able to know where you are going. Number one is define your mission. Define your mission. What is the reason for my existence? And that goes back to the first question. Why did God create me? Once you are able to answer that question, you have defined the reason for your existence. You all exist for different purposes. And once you know why you exist, you have defined your mission. Number two, you should be able to develop a vision. You should be able to tell yourself that from now to the next five years, this is where I want to go to based on the, my capacity to define my mission. I will now develop a vision for myself. When we started training and development, I defined my mission. I believe that God created me to build the capacity of people. So mm -hmm. I defined my mission. But then I set a vision. I developed a vision. I said to my staff, if we are able to stay in this for seven years, we'll become a university. So we work towards the becoming a university. Even though at the time I was saying this, I had just borrowed 500 Ghana cities from a lady who had been retrenched from the bank and has some money on her and she has bought um, um, treasury bills. So I went to her and I said, if you borrow me 500 Ghana cities, I will give you an interest of 120% per annum. That's 10% every month. She looked at what I had. She believed in it and borrowed, gave me that 500 Ghana cities. Mm. It's about eight years ago. But I had a vision. I had a vision. But I, I didn't have a I didn't have an office. I didn't mm. even have a telephone. Wow. I started all this training thing from a dining hall table I had in my hall. And I was living wow. in somebody's boys quarters, uncompleted boys quarters. Even then. And one member of my church who traveled out and came back had bought new set of furniture. So he brought me the uh, his Daniel Hall desk. So out of that, <laughs> out of that 500 Ghana cities I borrowed, I bought a Pentium 2 desktop computer, which was 250 Ghana cities. And then, uh, which was 150 Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. Then I bought my first half page, black and white half page advert in the daily graphic then. And that was 250 Ghana cities. I was left with 100 Ghana cities. Then I got stationary. That hundred Ghana cities, and I did my first conference with it. Okay. Today I'm a we are a university, and that was because I developed a vision that by the seventh year we become a university. Ben and on the seventh year we became a university. We became the Graduate School of Governance and Leadership. So define your mission, develop a vision, and, and uh, the, the, the question purpose. The purpose, and then the third thing is that set your objectives. Set your objectives right. I said in seven years' time, we'll become an university. Like now, we have a five-year plan mm. for our university. 
that in five years' time, we should become one of the major names in the West African sub-region, providing not only academic programs, but also short-term executive development programs for middle to senior level management. And we have a five-year plan. But you see, within this five-year plan, within these five years, we have seconds, we have minutes, we have hours, and then we have days, then we have weeks. So what we have done is that when you set your objectives, you are able to take advantage of the minutes and all those things within that five years. And that is what uh, certain objectives that time-bound results. Mm. And then the fourth question you should answer under, listen, to do under the purpose question is devising a strategy. Bernard, I believe that success is more of a strategy than effort. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether this is where I, I, I made the statement, but you remember when Chelsea played mm -hmm. uh, Barcelona? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know Barcelona, the Champions League, Barcelona played about 72% of the game. Possession. Possession. Chelsea played 28% of it. Mm -hmm. By the end of the day, it was Chelsea that won and went on to become European champions. Why? That game, Barcelona played more with effort. Was Chelsea played with strategy. Hmm. You understand? Chelsea defended because Barcelona has very skillful players. They didn't use the ball through the midfield because the midfield, Barcelona controls the midfield. They have to kick the ball over. So Chelsea's strategy won over Barcelona's effort. And what, in fact, I, I tell people that the Western world is based more on strategy and we try to achieve things based on effort. That's why we warm our food on cold pot. The <laughs> Western world warms their food with microwave. So microwave is a strategy, cold pot is an effort. <laughs> Interesting point, yeah. You understand? That's why we wash our things with our hands and the Western world wash their things with... <laughs> I mean, the more advanced societies... With, That's right. With the washing machine. That's right. So strategy is important and to be able to answer the purpose question you need to finally to be able to answer the purpose question you need to set your values so five things that can make you purpose driven develop uh, define your mission develop a vision set your objectives devise strategies and establish your how purpose. important are values and the purpose because um, there is mission vision objective strategy yeah. but it, values looks like a softer side of issues it's not i'll deal with values as i go that's okay. why i'm just Good. trying so that's the second issue the second, second question i'm not sure we can finish the 21 we, we can finish so, yeah, so i but I, my intention was to just rush through them but once i'm i'm now trying no, elaborate to, on them okay. so we, i think it's better with more depth than just okay quantity. okay okay the third question is the preparation question the preparation question am i ready am i ready anything you try to get yourself involved in the major question you should ask yourself is that, am I ready mm -hmm. for this? Am I ready for this? Mm -hmm. We are, uh, I think this weekend, there's going to be uh, the African Cup of Nations. There are countries that are camping, their players spending a lot of money. What are they doing? They are getting ready for this assignment. And in fact, you will notice that the country that will win will be the country that is very well prepared. Not countries that just will gather us uh, players in three days before the time and then they go to play. You can't, you can't become successful with less preparation. In fact, most successful people prepare a lot before they get into anything they get themselves involved in. The preparation question allows you to determine your road worthiness. You can you never be allowed to put a car on the road without the roadworthiness of that car being determined. <laughs> My sister told me a very funny story. She, she had a new car, um, and I think after a year, the roadworthiness the road certificate expired. Mm -hmm. And she hadn't gone to renew it. And she drove the car and uh, was arrested by the police. But just before the police arrested her, there was an old trotter without tail lights. Uh, without reflect, 
reflectors at the back. Mm -hmm. And then, just before she her car was stopped, a police officer has stopped that trotro and allowed the trotro after talking to the driver and allowed the trotro to go. <laughs> so, when the police officer arrested my sister and said, you don't have a road wedding certificate, my sister said, you can't arrest me with that without arresting that car going. Mm -hmm. What is assurance that this car has a road when certificate? But the fact of the matter is that even in driving on our roads, you need to be, have road where it is able to be there. Life is like a journey. Whatever you are doing is like a journey. Without road worthiness, you are not ready because as you get your, yourself involved in things, that is where challenges, that's where you face challenges. And you need to be ready. Before, throughout the scriptures, God never uses anybody that is not ready for the assignment, that is not well prepared for his assignment. For mm. his assignment. Mm. The question number four is the people's question. The, the people. people's question. The people question. The people question. And that's what, what kind of people do I need in my life, in my assignment? This is where you have to define relationships and you have to redefine relationships. Bernard, Jesus came was born in a small town by a carpenter and an unemployed woman. And after 2,500 years, hmm. he has the most powerful religious organization that has ever lived, that has ever existed. existed. Why did he achieve this great feat? He knew the people he wanted. He selected 12 ordinary unschooled men he was able to assemble the right balance of skills he needed for his assignment and that was why after he's, he's left and gone these 12 men were able to put their lives down for this vision they were ready to die for this vision can you imagine peter being crucified. And he was not only begging them not to crucify him, but was begging them not to crucify him like the way they crucified Jesus. And that he didn't deserve to die like the way Jesus died. So they had to crucify him upside down. A leader's ability to build a team and a vision and transition oh. is vision to them. It's essential for the success of that assignment. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus was able to transition. He was able to carry his vision and pass it on to these 12 unschooled ordinary men who also carried it on to the next level. Jesus only spent three years on his assignment, but his assignment has survived. His vision has survived for over 2,000 years. Why? Because he was able to answer the people question. What kind of people do I need? What kind of relationship do I need to build? What kind of teams do I need to build for my assignment? Mm. The question number five that successful leaders ask themselves is the probity question. Mm. The probity question. What values should govern my behavior? What values should, should govern my behavior? You know, Bernard, the worst thing that can ever happen to any leader is to get to that point where no rule governs your behavior. It's a dangerous place to be. You see, especially you become the head of your organization, you are the head of your home, you are the head of everything, and then you make the rules and nobody hmm. make any rule to regulate your behavior. It is dangerous. And that's why even a country like Ghana, we have rules that even govern the behavior of the president. Even though he's the president, but there are rules, there are constitution. There's a constitution that tell, tells the president how to behave. If your public life as leader is different from your private life, Hmm. If your private life is different from your public appearance, you will be in trouble. The two must be the same. The two must be the same. Clinton tried it, even though <laughs> he was the president of the most powerful nation. 
on earth, yet Clinton was reduced to a piece of bread hmm. because his private <laughs> life was different from his public appearance. You know, it's in the Bible. The Bible says that um, a hollish woman, a hollish woman can reduce you to a piece of bread. Hmm. And that's what happened to Clinton. We're talking about the 21 questions successful leaders must ask themselves with Bishop Titiofe. He says, life is a question. There's the providence question. There's the purpose question. There is the preparation question. There's a people question. There's a property question. I have quite a number of comments I want to throw to you. Maybe let me let you go through the first seven. Then I'll, I'll put a few questions to you. So what's the sixth and what's the seventh? The sixth question is the passion question. Passion. The passion question. The passion question. What keeps me going in the face of challenges? Hmm. What keeps me going in the face of challenges? You see, Bernard, what you are not passionate about, you are not committed to. It is important that you discover what you are passionate about and allow your passion to drive you. Don't do things because others are doing them. Do things because you are, you, you are emotionally attached to those things you do. I never speak on any subject I'm not passionate about. Sometimes people will invite you because they hear you speak. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, Reverend, can you come to our church and address us on this topic? <laughs> what I'm not passionate about, I will not accept to speak about it. I am passionate about helping people to discover their purpose, helping people to know Christ, helping people to create wealth, and helping people to impact their generation. Any topic that falls within these four things I'm passionate about, Bernard, I speak about it. Mm. I, am, I never pursue any Thing, no matter how attractive it is, if that thing is not my passion, you know, my passion is about sharing information. Yep. There are people who come to me and offer different business opportunities for me. I say, you know, if I put my money into this, mm -hmm. I will not even dream about it. I don't even think about it. I, I put my money where my passion is. So it's important because it is when you are pursuing your passion and you are confronted with challenges, that's when you don't give up. But that is your passion. You are pursuing your passion. Mm. The seventh question is the period question. Hey. The period question. And the period question is this. What says the time? Wow. What says the time? What says the time? You know, Ben, and the Bible says that there's time for everything. Mm. And the season for every activity under heaven. One of the hallmarks of great leaders, successful leaders, is that they know they understand the times and they know what to do at every time. Mm. Life is like a timetable. Or if you study the timetable of life very well, you will discover that there are certain seasons and certain times that you should do certain things. Mm -hmm. If you end up doing yesterday's things today, mm -hmm. you are likely to push today's things to tomorrow. And then you will not have time to do tomorrow's things because there is no time beyond tomorrow. Hmm. So what successful people do is that they understand that they must manage their time well. You must do, you should have done yesterday's things yesterday. And you are in today because you are doing today's things today. And you go to tomorrow because you have something to do tomorrow. Hmm. If you end up doing yesterday's things today, you're already running late in time. And you have to be very, very careful hmm. about that. Wow. It's exciting stuff coming in from Bishop Titi Affair. Uh, providence, purpose, uh, preparation, people, probity, passion, and period. It's quite clear all these start with P, and I can see how some are linked. So it's possible that you may have been formed for a purpose, but the time is not right. You may not be ready. So it looks like a lot of these things are interlinked. Yeah. So um, uh, because I'm going to ask whether one has to follow the other. From what you've said, it's quite clear that preparation. Sorry. Uh, Providence is the starting point. Yes. But a lot of the others seem to be mixed up. Let me read a quick text somebody sent on one of the issues, and then I'll take your reaction to that, and we'll go on. Uh, Bernard, why do motivational leaders always talk about strategy as a winning formula? I haven't heard him talk about execution, but trust me, strategy without execution will achieve nothing but just cheap talk on paper. The pain is in execution. That's where we find results and win. This is in relation to the purpose question where you said 
define your mission, develop a vision, set your objectives, devise a strategy, set your values. Somebody saying that strategy is great, but execution is where there's problem. This is more in context with, I'm sure, uh, strategy for a company, strategy formulation, even for your life. Um, I, I is there a place in your twenty-one questions for execution? Yeah, yeah. But as as we go, we'll come to places where I'll deal. Uh, execution. Uh, w with those issues. But better, you see, when we look at strategy, sometimes it's very uh, difficult to try to separate. Well, a strategy encompasses all those things. If you have a very good strategy, as part of the strategy, you should have a plan for execution. Okay. Yeah, I, I know, but That's maybe right. in within marketing context, they tend to separate okay. strategy from execution. Let's go on. So you have the period, the which is the time. What time? What time it is? Do you know what time it is? That's right. Because you know, Ben, life is divided into three um, segments. From the day you were born up to when you are twenty-five years old, is a is a time that you should be discovering your skills and developing them. Hmm. By the time you are 25 years old at least, you have come out of the university, you have finished your national service and everything, and now you have discovered and developed your skill. And now between 25 to 60 years old, you are selling your skills. You are selling, it's a wealth creation type where you are selling your skills. Mm. By 60 years old, you should be retiring and should be benefiting from, from the wealth you have created. Mm. If after 25 years, you are still looking for your skills and you have not developed anything and you have nothing to sell, you are in trouble. Hmm. So you should know where you are, which time you are in, and what you should be doing. To me, from from the day you were born up to when you were 25 years old, is the most important time of your life hmm. where you should be committed to developing your... That's what the educational system is structured in such a way that you come out of the university around that time. You finish the national service around that time. And the educational system is structured in a way that you are helped within education to discover your abilities and that's why education has several branches and so once you are there in fact the purpose of our junior high school was to ensure that by the time you are finishing junior high school you would have discovered who you really want to uh, be and what you want to do and that was why they introduced all these workshops including uh, carpentry and all those things that unfortunately are not being implemented very very well so you finish junior high school you still don't even know what you want to do. But basically, the first set of your educational listing from the day you were born at 25 years old, you should have discovered your skills, you should have developed them, and you are ready to sell them. Mm. From 25 to 60 is when you are selling your skills and even rediscovering more, and developing it more, and making investment from the sales of your skills. And then by 60 years old, you should be retiring mm. and making, uh, enjoying the fruit of your labor. So the, the last 25 years of your life should not be spent working. It should not be spent working. Spent reaping from where you've worked. And then being a consultant. A consultant is someone who thinks for those who worry. <laughs> <laughs> you a know, consultant is someone who thinks for those who worry. Thinking is using your mind to generate ideas that solve problems. I like that. Worrying is using your mind to magnify problems. Wow. So anybody who is magnifying the problem goes to a consultant and the consultant thinks for them. So the consultant thinks and charges you for thinking for you. Mm. Superb. Engineer Seth Adam Agbatonu says, Bernard, the bishop had his inspiration from the lecture hall, got some money by whatever means to start. Ask him what happens if you have plans or goals, but do not have the capital to start it, or if you are not in a position to secure a loan either. <laughs> Bernard, you see, I, I, I think that... Um, um, what I just said should rather inspire the, <laughs> the, the engineer to see that um, once you have a good vision and a good dream, you don't need money to start. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the money. But you always have someone who has the money. And when that person believes in that dream you have because you have successfully packaged it very well and communicated it very, very well, there, there is always someone somewhere who has the money. In fact, if I had time, when my book comes out, you realize that where I spoke about people, I outlined the kind of people you need around you, the kind of people mm. you want to build relationship with, the people with the skills you need, the people with the resources you need, the people with the brain you need. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to build this. And for instance, running a university is a very costly thing. But I was privileged to have built relationships with certain people 
whose skills I could employ and pay less than 25 percent or what <laughs> what they would have charged others others mm. i built relationship with people who would i could put on my university council and make very very good the people i would have gone to consult in their offices and they would have charged me consultancy fee are now on my university council and consult their, cons their consultation is free wow. i only pay um sitting allowance at the university council meetings and i get everything free from them so build relationship. Never ever say that mm. there is no opportunity for you to access free money. Mm. They are there. Just build good relationship and build strategic relationships. Mm. They are there. You can get it. So that has to do with the people question. The people. Give me a few more of the questions. You've given me providence, purpose, preparation, people, probability, which is values, passion, which is uh, obvious, and then the period. Yeah. Let's talk about a few more. The eighth one. The eighth one is the prediction question. Wow. The prediction question. What does the past and the present tell you about the future? Mm. Men and one's ability to, to take very good lessons from his past enables the person to understand his present. And based on lessons from the past, mm -hmm. And your understanding of the present, you are able to predict the future without being a prophet. Listen, leaders must have three sights. One is a hindsight, two is insight, and the third one is foresight. So these are the three sides of most successful leaders. Mm. The hindsight, the ability to look back assess the mistakes, do analysis of your past and see where you fought it and where you succeeded and learn lessons from your past and then see what your past is doing to your present and try to find solutions to it. When you are able to do this, Bernard, mm. it creates a future for you. Wow. Insight, foresight, hindsight. All necessary for your future. So this is the you must have predictive powers. That's right. So the prediction question. I see. What's the next one? The next one is the prudence question. Okay. The prudence question. There's only a thin line between the prudence question and the prediction question because they all relate to the future. The prudence question is this: How do I avoid dangers ahead? The prudence question is: How do I avoid dangers ahead? Ben, you know that, like I've said, life is like a journey. On a dangerous road mm. but one thing about dangerous road is that there are always road signs that tell us what is ahead of us my wife is very protective of me and most of the times when i have to travel i said okay my dear i'm traveling to Takradi to do a program she said, hey that road i don't want you to drive on that road it's a very dangerous road <laughs> then my dear i'm going to kumasi to do something ah you're not going to kumasi do, do, did you hear about that accident? <laughs> Last time I asked my dear, so what? Which road in Ghana is, is safe? He said the road to my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> but see, Bernard, yeah. the, the the point here is that even though my wife will protest, I will still manage to convince her to go. But I always go and I come back safe. I come back in peace, not in pieces. Why? Because Bernard, I drive on these dangerous roads, observing the road signs. I do not ignore when the road sign is telling me that 50 kilometers per hour. Mm. So that you have people in your car who will tell you, ah, that is this engine there, you can't do 50 kilometers per hour. The road is there, why don't you go? <laughs> the sign is telling you mm. that if you go beyond 50 kilometers per hour and there's a problem, you cannot control it. Uh, most of the times, it is when you are entering into a densely populated community. is where you see those 50 kilometers per hour. Sometimes they will tell you, cattle crossing. Mm -hmm. If don't I, they will tell you, slow down, work in progress. Just obey the road signs and you are safe. You will go and you will come back safely. Now, people around us, people who have gone ahead of us, the stories of people who have gone ahead of us are all indication of the road signs, of the dangers ahead. In fact, their stories are the road signs that tell us the dangers ahead. And that is why every leader every successful leader has one particular person in his life and that person 
is a mentor. Because your mentor has gone ahead of you. He has traveled on that road before. And your mentor's story is a road sign. Mm -hmm. It's a road sign that tells you what is ahead of you. Yeah. I've been asking him for 22 years. Wow. But yesterday we hosted, uh, we, um, the Archbishop is hosting um, some prophets from the U.S. Mm. and asked me to uh, pick them from the airport. And the lead prophet was chatting with me and said he's been pastoring for 58 years. Wow. Pastoring. 58 years. That's... For 58 years. Wow. Which means that he started pastoring 10 years before I was born. <laughs> you understand? Incredible. This man's story mm. should be a road sign for me. And he said something that was very profound. You know what he said? He's, no, there's a second prophet with him. And whilst we're waiting, that second prophet said, this year, he celebrated, he's celebrating his 50th anniversary, wedding anniversary with his wife. Mm. And he said, within these 50 years, I have never cheated on my wife. 50 years. It carried a message that success, every success has something behind it. Mm -hmm. Bernard, so these men, within the short time I spent with them at the airport and what they said, they, they gave me an information that should carry me on the next 10 years. Their story has become a road sign for me mm -hmm. to observe. Wow. Interesting stuff in there. Wow, time is running. Let's pick a few more uh, before I read more questions. Look, uh, the prudence question, and let's let's give me about three more before we, we close. The tenth question, Bernard, is the pre precision question. Okay. The precision question. What should be my focal point? What should be my focal point? I I I love watching animals. In fact, one of the <clears throat> one of the books about the sixth leadership book I'm doing is is titled The Zoology of Leadership. Wow. The seven animals who teach us how to lead. Mm. And the lion is one of those animals I'm going to focus on. The amazing thing about the lion is that when the lion is hunting, the lion's hunting skills, let's say a number of animals, let's say the deer, for instance, a number of them, and the lion decides to hunt one down. Bernard, all the things you, folk, you notice about the lion is that when the lion chooses one of the years to go after. It doesn't matter those that are close to the lion. The lion will always spot the weakest one amongst them, the easiest one to catch. And the lion can run through a number of them just to get that, just one. To get that one. And it will not be distracted by all the attractions of the other ones around. Mm. And the lion will focus on that thing. And that's why the lion is one of the most successful uh, hunters. Mm -hmm. Your ability to stay focused without allowing other things to distract you is key, very, very, very key to your success. Hmm. Your capacity, Bernard, your capacity to have a target, stay focused, and avoid distraction is essential for your success in leadership. So the pre precision question deals with the issue of focus. A man whose focus is easily broken never gets to his own destination. It's a man who stays focused. Mm -hmm. They have one, one time I, I I have said this here before, so I think last year or so, my our last but one boy had um when my wife was carrying him, well, it was very difficult for my wife. So most of the times he spent she spent the time at home. One time I came from town and my wife said to me, and honey, I think, I think today I'm fine. I've been home for long and I want you to drive me around. So I put my wife in the car. I started driving around. We were all right, Bernard. We were all right until we got to a tea junction. And now we had to decide where to go. <laughs> Fortunately for us, the traffic light was up red. So we had some few minutes, mm -hmm. some few seconds to make a decision. So over there I said, so my dear, where do you want us to go? And she was like, where do you want us to go to? <laughs> I said, you said you go out. She said, you are taking me out. You understand? What we were doing at the time was that we were only joyriding. We didn't have a mission. We had no focus. 
we were not precise as to where we were going. And that was why we could not even predict the T junctions and made a decision before getting there. When, when you notice in your life that consistently you get to the T junction before you start making a decision, it's what, what is simple. It's because you are not precise enough. You don't have enough focus. Mm. Behave like the lion. Stay focused. Be precise. Know what you are looking for and go for it. Never be distracted by other um, opportunities there. Just focus on that one and go. Wow. So it means you shouldn't pre uh, be sh as a, don't 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 let a decision be made at the moment of the trial. Decide ahead of time what you want to do, and then when you get there, you already know that if I get to the teacher, I'm making a left. That's an interesting. And that's point. what precise people do, and that's what people with focus they do, and that's why leaders who succeed are people who are very precise, very intentional, very calculative, and they are very focused. The eleventh question mm -hmm. is the promotion question. Okay. The promotion question: How far? How do I? How do I go further? How do I go further? That any time you see a stagnation in your life, you should be thinking something has gone wrong. Any time you realize that you have no progress plan, hmm. that when I get to two, I should have a plan to move to three. All the things I didn't even didn't notice it until my friends kept telling me that you leave the affair for six months and the time you come back to see him again, mm. he is somewhere else. One's ability to progress in life is essential for the person's success. So all the time you should be able to have what I call the progress plan. Mm. Then number twelve is the personality question. Wow. The personality question. How do I build a self-image that sells? How do I build a self-image that sells? Three things. And these are the three things leaders, successful leaders do. Number one, character development. Number two, CV enrichment. And number three, appearance glamorization. I think you have to take your time on this one. <laughs> you said the, the personality question, how do I build a self-image that sells? A self-image that sells. That's right. Wow. And you're saying there's the character development, character development, CV enrichment, CV enrichment. Yes. So go to school and uh, get more qualifications and work hard and make sure that you're, you're professionally developed. CV enrichment and then appearance glamorization. Ap <laughs> what? <laughs> appearance glamorization. That's right. Why is that important? It is important because better God looks at the heart, but man looks at the actual appearance. So you must satisfy There were a few cleaners who were coming for an interview, and my wife had to interview them. Mm -hmm. By people's appearance, he just disqualified them. She just come to my office and said, Honey, I don't think this person can work. That's why. <laughs> you ask why, you say, ah, look, at the, look at the way the person is dressed, you know. So there are people like that. I mean, I mean man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. That's why you are nicely dressed here, <laughs> Bernard. Look at your suit <laughs> and your tie, you know, because you understand what uh, appearance glamorization, appearance glamorization. is. Uh, interesting. Bernard, CV mm -hmm. is um, CV is a summary of the value you have added to yourself. Mm. When I take your CV, it tells me how much you are worth. The value. You see, God, the amazing thing about God is that God did not give us already made things. God gave us everything in their raw state. Mm. God did create already canned sardines or already canned mango juice or mango trees mm -hmm. or already made chocolates, cocoa trees. Mm. But everything God created were in their raw state. The poverty of Africa hmm. is because what God gave us raw, we either eat it raw or sell it raw. <laughs> and that also comes to your personal life. Hmm. You were born raw. You didn't even come with clothes. You came naked. Yeah. You know, how much you are worth today, Bernard, is determined by the value you have added to yourself. Hmm. And this value is summarized in your CV. 
So what people are ready to pay for your services is determined by your CV. But people don't only look at the CV. Sometimes they also want to see the personality behind the CV, which is very important. And that's why when you are presenting your CV, you are asked that you should have references. People who can, who can attest to your character, who can attest to your loyalty, who can attest to your, to, to your attitude, which is essential. And that's why character development is important because people will look at the personality behind the CV. CV is important because it tells whoever is dealing with you the value you have added to yourself. One day I was speaking about this, building a self-image that sells in the church. And I asked my church a very profound question. I said that if there's a job opportunity that is paying $10,000 a month, you have a CV, I would be so confident and take there and say, I am worth $10,000 a month. Hmm. That's a good question. Here are some questions and comments. Uh, on Twitter, at Tupi, it says, uh, be focused, behave like the lion, never get distracted by the wayside attraction. Decide before you get to the T-junction and hashtag TT of faith. Frank Doyi says, as usual, a perfectly balanced breakfast, giving equal attention to all the important issues. God bless you, Bernard, and the team. Uh, Elinio, tweeting at uh, Man Yavu, says, thank you for bringing Reverend to your face. It's really inspiring us this morning. Uh, Israel, also <clears throat> tweeting as uh, Judge Israel, says, um, Yo, you guys are really the best. If it must be radio, then it must be CTFM. Carl, Treating at Brack Cow says, I have been so ungrateful to Bishop Titi of Faith. Bishop, thank you for changing my life four years after I met you. You've been an inspiration. Martin wants to know if I can start listing the questions for him somewhere. Okay, I've tweeted some of the questions, I'll tweet a few more. Um, he all goes on saying, This man is great, highly favored, and empowered to inspire. I'm really learning a lot from the program today. Francis Fiacuna says, God bless you, Bishop. I am in love with your discussion and then another one coming in from Sami Mankazi. Bernard, can you introduce a segment on the CBS once a week where you bring people like Bishop Titi Ofe, Day to Me, Albert Okran and Atu Sapo and Co. Louis from Kaswas says, Bernard, please ask him whether there are, in, there are any secrets behind success. Oh, Louis, that's the whole point of the discussion today. Uh, Paul says, a bishop is a big shop uh, that's either full or empty, but you seem to be full. Uh, how full are you, Bishop from Bowie? And this one says, this is from Selassie Oting. Bernard, in fact, I congratulate, congratulate the Bishop for me. He's really influenced me greatly. I teach, but I have serious issues with people being ignorant about simple things. Um, somebody says, if one takes these questions seriously to help shaping their lives, Kwachi Kwenu Felix says, the Bishop's ideas are deep. Selassie is asking a question. What's the difference between a career and the call of God? Maybe you should answer that question for Selassie. Mm -hmm. The difference between your career and the call of God. <laughs> or is it the same? So if you have, if it, it, it depends on where you find yourself. Mm -hmm. You may call it a career. You may call it the call of God. It depends on, when you find yourself more in the church and doing God's work, you might say that this is a call from God. But I believe that what Bernard is doing is a call. You, mm -hmm. the, the management people, the human resource people will call it a career. Mm -hmm. But it's a call. God designed you, created you for this particular purpose. For what you do every morning for this city and for your intervention in certain things and for information you bring and for taking politicians on and for ensuring that if light is going on and is destroying the fridge of a poor woman, a poor woman who saved for five years to buy a small fridge and they are destroying it for you to bring it to attention. If people are doing U10 on the motorway that can kill an innocent young man who can become the president of this country, you bring it to our attention. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is a call. This is a call. You mm -hmm. can call it a career, but it's a call. So if you are lucky, your call and your career will be the same as I am. Some 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 don't have it. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's a few more comments. Yeah. Bishop Tiji is a prolific speaker, always dwells on the realities of life. Anytime I am on vacation, I church with his church. Another one says, Ben, at this Man is one I listen to every Sunday morning before anything else. I love his messages. Mind you, Bishop, City of Fair's uh, sermons are on CTFM on Sunday morning at exactly 6.30. 6.30, Shipford Chapel. Just your final thoughts before you depart. A lot of people seem to have been inspired by this. You're releasing this book in how many weeks? 
Um, Bernard, I, I'll do that in June because it's, it's coming together with other books. books okay. And I want to make sure that I come out with what I call the Leaders Library. Mm. The Leaders Library. Um, the first set, the, the Leaders Library Volume 1, is, is, is the six books on contemporary leadership thoughts. Mm. Yes. That's exciting. Yes. Thank you, Bishop Jean Titi Ofei from the, the head of the ship. And one thing I want to do, maybe yeah. we may talk about it later. I, I, I'm going to try to see if I can introduce what I call the 21 questions every leader must answer in 21 days. Hey. And get a 21 day airtime for your station Amazing. and take my time to do this thing. <laughs> the whole um, leadership series on 21 days on this so I can take my time to do it mm. and then get people to answer questions on the internet and then we can be awarded a certificate all to, in 21 days all in 21, 21 days. day leadership course amazing Francis Okoama says I'm listening to your guest I'm learning a lot of great things from him uh, let me just run through the first 13 he gave us I believe or 12 actually the providence question which is the question of life itself uh, what basically that's the number one question the purpose question is where am i going the preparation question is am i ready for this the people question is who do i need the probity question what value should govern my behavior the passion question what keeps me going in the face of challenges the period question you know what time it is i'm sure sarko they will say he does the prediction question is the eighth one uh that is a, really a question of what do the past and present tell you about the future yes must have insight and foresight then there's the prudence question how do i avoid dangers ahead the precision question what should be my focal point it gives the example of the lion the promotion question is how do i go further what is my progress plan and then the personality question how do i build a self-image that sells i'm sure we'll bring him in to do the 13th to the 21st later on thank you very much for passing through the studio thank you Bernard. thank have you for having me